All right, we're going to be looking at Philippians again this morning. And we've been talking about healthy church over these weeks. Today we're going to be talking about healthy relationships. And so I want you to go back to the second chapter. We're going to wrap up the second chapter today. Um, last time I preached, if you remember, I had shared with you about Paul's exhortation concerning how we are to relate to the world around us, specifically the unsaved. That was last week's message. And the key verse or verses that we read um, were those that began in verse 14. I want us just to review these, just these three verses, 14, 15, and 16. Philippians 2, verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. You know, we've got to watch our testimony. Just, I mean, you know, not, not even all the bad stuff we could possibly do, but just grumbling and murmuring and complaining in front of those who don't yet know the Lord is going to deter them from being interested in the God that you know personally. And so, as I had mentioned, you know, that Sunday morning... We need to be careful how we relate to the world around us. And now secondly, we, we need to understand how to relate to each other. And that's going to be our focus for today. And I, and I think we should probably look again at those verses. And this begins at verse 19 of chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 19 says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him. Who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests. Not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as a son with his father. He has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. My brother, co-worker, fellow soldier who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ." He risked his life to, to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. And I thank you for these two wonderful examples, these men of God that have been mentioned in this chapter. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would speak to us and show us exactly how we can best relate to one another as members of a healthy church. And I pray your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And again, as I just prayed, we see mention here of two tremendous men of God in this passage. We, we see that Paul commends Timothy, and then he mentions Epaphroditus. And of Timothy, he said, I have no one else like him. I have no one else like him. There's no one else of his character, no one else of his caliber. That's, that's, I mean, that is something. And then Epaphroditus is introduced as a brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, and in fact, we read that Epaphroditus was so committed to Paul and to the ministry that he, almost, that he fell ill and almost died. And he would have died if it had not been for a miracle of divine healing. And I like what that final verse had to say about this brother, Epaphroditus. Verse 30 said, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. You talk about commitment. Talk about selflessness. You see, one of the messages that Jesus lived out before us, and of course he preached it, and even propagated among his apostles, was, was a concept of selfless giving. Selfless living. Giving to others. You know, and Jesus Christ himself gave that ability to us. He's given us an ability to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him. 
To be willing to, to, to let our lives be poured out for the sake of others. And frankly, folks, you know, I look around, of course, forget the world, but even in some churches, I'm telling you what, I, I, I'm convinced that this teaching has long fallen out of favor in churches. It, it's been buried for, for way too long and, and has been replaced by a raw selfishness. It's in society. And you know what? It's in a lot of churches too. Just a couple weeks ago, I had taught from the very first verses of this second chapter. And we were admonished in that chapter to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And it, and it went on, it said, Who although he was God, emptied himself, became nothing, became a servant, became a slave, and humbled himself even to death, Roman style, on a cross of shame. You see, Jesus, he didn't just preach this. He didn't just tell us this. He lived this. He showed us how it could be done. How that we could lay down our lives for others. And beginning in his gospels and then in the epistles, there's an emphasis upon that same attitude and his connection to being a true disciple. And friends, a lot of people are Christians. But mine is suggest to you that not as many are disciples. And, and I don't mean to split hairs, but here's how I separate the two. A Christian, a truly born-again believer, is anyone who knows Christ as their Savior and is someday going to reside eternally in heaven. That's the basic definition of a Christian, right? It's someone who knows that heaven is their future home. But let me suggest to you that a disciple is something more. A disciple is one who not only knows that heaven is theirs someday, not only is Christ their Savior... But he's also their master. He's also their Lord. And you see, I perceive two different levels of commitment here. Two different levels of involvement between these two. You know, it's like a story I, I, I read a long time ago about a hen and a hog. And the two were walking down a country lane one Sunday morning. And they came upon a little country church. It was before Sunday school. And it was breakfast. And the church was having a fundraiser. They're holding an egg and ham breakfast and to raise money. They needed new hymn books. And so upon seeing the sign, the hen turned to the hog. And, and, he, and he said to the hog, why don't we stop in and help? Why don't we stop in and make a donation? To which the hog wisely replied, hey, for you it's a donation. For me it's a commitment. You see, the Christian... Yeah, it's one of those mornings, isn't it? <laughs> Midsummer. The Christian realizes... That they have made a decision and they now possess protection from the eternal flames of hell. That's a Christian. And, 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 and as a Christian, not a disciple, but as a Christian, they're going to pick and choose their degree of involvement in the body of Christ. If they feel like going to life group or Sunday school, then, then they'll go. If it's something coming up at church they're interested in, then they're going to be there. But if not, no problem. No big deal. Because you see, those people, for those people, the church is a consumer item. It's a matter of calculating what's in it for me. And I would venture, you know, I, I would never venture to judge someone's eternal situation. I would assume these kinds of Christians will make it into heaven. After all, there's only one condition of salvation. And that is to believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's Romans chapter 10 verse 9. You don't need to add anything to it. That's the basics. But you know what, those Christians who live like that, they're going to make it into heaven, but only, as Paul told the Corinthians, only as escaping through the flames. You see, there are Christians, yeah, blood washed, they're redeemed, and then there are disciples. To me, a disciple is a true follower. That's, what it is, that's the definition of a disciple, one who follows, one who is, is learning under the master. And they love to serve. Disciples love to serve. They, they don't come to church to get. They come to church to give. To find out what's needed and then to fill that need. And the real beauty about these disciples is that they give selflessly. They don't worry about the personal cost. Really, they never even consider it. They just love to give themselves and they love the Lord. And, and they love because... They know that they're loved by their Savior, by their Lord. It's almost like what Jesus had told the prostitute who had washed his feet. He said, he who has been forgiven little loves little, but he who has been forgiven much loves much. 
And you see, a true disciple understands that they are indebted to God and they're grateful and appreciative for all that God has done for them. That's a disciple. But it's got to have application. I mean, you just say, this person is a Christian, this person is a... They both believe the same. They both believe the same. It's just that a disciple lives out what they believe. And the application for that shows up in what I think we would call body ministry. The church is a body. It's the body of Christ. And it was created and ordained and brought into existence with a specific design that would bring strength and edification to the believers. And so what I'm saying is this, that our purpose as disciples is to live selflessly in fellowship with other believers. Amen? That's our calling. And there are a couple different expressions of this. There are a couple different layers to this. One layer being our church family. The other expression being our natural family. The Bible says that we're to serve each other. We're to give to one another. We're to minister to one another. And here's here's a sampling. Matthew 25 verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Whatever we do for someone else, we do for him. And then there's Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't think of yourself. Don't think so much of yourself. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All that describes selfless living. All that describes a generosity and pouring yourself out for the sake of others. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, another passage on body ministry, on the body of Christ. Beginning in verse 18, it says, But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that his parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Those are three very clear references, don't you think? They're all concerned with the church body. And they're all very clear. And here, here's one for the home, Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his wife loves himself. Amen? <laughs> a couple smart husbands out there. Yes. I just thought I'd give you a chance for some bonus points. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And of course, there are so many more, there are many, many more references found in scripture that we could look at today. But these few references, they remind us of how we're meant to fit together, how we're meant to work together. And by the way, both the human body and the church body are truly amazing. They're wonderful in their function. It's incredible. When our bodies are healthy, they're capable of some fantastic accomplishments. Really. I mean, I just, you know, I marvel. I marvel at, at Olympic athletes and the stuff they do and the records that keep getting broken. The skills and the ability of people. And even in the church, the skills and the abilities of believers are incredible. When these, when these individual skills and abilities come together in the church body, that's even more incredible. You see, everything that we have achieved throughout the relatively short history of this church has been wrought through the selfless giving of individual disciples. Really. You know, everything that we do in world missions, everything we do in our community, everything we do here, even within our four walls, is because an abundance of people give of themselves freely. That's how it happens. And you know, folks, we all, we all want to live with a healthy human body. And boy, you don't really appreciate that until something happens, right? You don't realize how important, how valuable health is. We all want to have a healthy human body. And you know what? Because of that, I think we should also desire a healthy church body. And yet the reality of the passage we started out today tells us about a man by the name of Epaphroditus who got ill, deathly ill. Because somehow a virus or a bacteria entered his body, complications arose. He almost died. He said, if it wasn't for the grace of God, he wouldn't have made it. But here again, all of the parts of the body work together to correct the problem. The aim of the body is to get healthy again. When the body's not healthy, the aim of the body, the priority of the body is to be healthy again. If I begin to get congested in my lungs, the other parts of my body don't abandon ship. Really, vital organs don't run away from each other. They don't try to avoid each other. Rather, they help out. They try to compensate however they can in dealing with the problem at hand. Every part goes into like a hyperdrive to try to bring health to the body. All the parts of the natural body seem to go into this mode in order to combat whatever has attacked the physical human body. And so it is, or ought to be, with our church body, our church family. Even our natural family. I want to skip ahead for a moment to this letter from Paul to the Philippians. And it's a fourth chapter. I've been telling you for weeks now, this church in Philippi was about as close to perfect as, a, as, a, as an earthly church could be. But today I want you to know that there was a problem. There was a relatively small one as problems might be, but nonetheless I want us to read about it. And it's in Philippians chapter 4, just two verses. Philippians 4, verse 2 and 3. Paul wrote, I plead with Yodia... And I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. That's verse 2. And verse 3, yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, I know we do have to read into this a little bit, but it really isn't hard. I want you to know that apparently these two women when they came to church, sat on opposite sides of the sanctuary. Or maybe, maybe, as some people do today, one would find out, okay, she's not coming this Sunday, I'll come. You with me? You know, maybe once one found out, the other one was staying home, okay, I'll come to church and I'll worship God and I'll hear from the preacher. But for some reason, and it's not shared in, these pass in this passage, these two women are at odds with each other. As we just read, these two gals had been extremely productive and Paul is asking for help to, to, to have them make up. To have them get along with each other again. And somehow Satan was able to separate these two women. Something had come between them. They couldn't, maybe they just couldn't stand each other or they couldn't stand to be around each other. Neither one was going to leave their church and yet they just could not tolerate each other. 
And because of that attitude, Satan was winning. Because as long as, long as there was unforgiveness, as long as there were un unresolved feelings in their hearts, they had become ineffective in regards to the ministry and to the things of God. And folks, listen to me carefully on this, okay? I believe that one reason that the offense, that the issue that divided these two women is not mentioned here. We're not told exactly what happened. And I believe there's a purpose in this. And I believe the reason we're not told what happened is on purpose. Because the fact of the matter is that really doesn't matter. What divided these two women really doesn't matter. In other words, it, it doesn't matter if it was a major issue or if it was something that was just totally insignificant. Really, it doesn't matter if one woman had cheated the other woman out of her life savings or maybe just snubbed her in some social snafu. It really doesn't matter. Do you understand that? The offense here isn't important. Because if it was, I'm afraid we'd use it as an excuse. Really, we'd be at odds with someone and say, you know, I have every right. Well, you'd, you'd go to quote this verse and it, well, that, that was just, that was just, this is much bigger. I'm justified in my unforgiveness. Do you understand that? The offense here is not, what, what happened is not important. What's important here is reconciliation. What's important here is that there be an exchange of forgiveness so that no more time and energy would be wasted so that Satan would no longer be glorified, so that these two women could once again come together and be productive and effective in the Lord. Amen? So will you, all of you, please admit that it takes a lot of energy to hold a grudge, doesn't it? It really does. Sometimes it, fe sometimes it feels very comfortable. Really, sometimes it just seems, it, some people it just seems very natural. But I'm going to tell you what, it really takes a lot of energy. It's tiring. It's exhausting. Because we get all bound up in our emotions. I've even known some people who become physically ill due to unforgiveness. Proverbs talks about a dryness in the bones from unforgiveness, from bitterness. An unfor a dryness in the bones. And, and some have suggested maybe that's like a type of arthritis or something. I don't know. But you see, Jesus taught forgiveness, didn't he? Hello? Hanging on a cross. Dying for our sins. Or dying for your sins. His final words included forgiveness. When he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Understand the power of forgiveness. Turn with me to Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. Let's look at these two verses. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking. He says, for if you forgive other people... When they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That makes sense. Amen. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's a passage that a lot of Christians don't acknowledge. I'm telling you, really. It's like somehow we, we pass over that one. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If we don't forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. But again, you know what? This Philippian church was a jewel. It was a great church. It really was. It had one small blemish that Paul made. We skipped ahead to chapter 4. But one small blemish. A blemish, though if left untreated, if not cleansed out, could become a roaring infection in the body of Christ. You know how that stuff works, right? Just a little tiny wound gets infected and it begins to fester and it, and it, grow, and it can become systemic. And so regardless of the offense, forgiveness is always the prescription. And that, of course, is true in church family. It's also true in your natural families. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, the apostle exhorts the men to be careful how they relate to their wives so that their prayers not be hindered. You don't want your prayers held back. Ladies and gentlemen, when we are at odds with one another, we lose. It's that simple. We become spiritually impotent. We become anemic. We become sickly. By holding on to pride and unforgiveness, we hand over the keys of our spiritual authority to the enemy of our souls. Satan's allowed to get the upper hand because as Jesus taught us, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The church of Jesus Christ and every Christian family rests upon a foundation of perfection. No, 
That's not true. The church does not stand on being perfect. Your household does not stand on being perfect. You know what it stands on? You know what it hinges on? You know what the cornerstone is? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Jesus Christ has been that perfect example of forgiveness. Of reconciliation. All sin. Past, present, and future. Lewis Meads once wrote, he said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free. And then to realize that the prisoner was you. And here's a reality. We, like the Philippian church, we have a great church. Praise Assembly is so productive in so many ways for the Lord. I have nothing but commendation for the leaders of this church and the workers of this church and our church family. And yet at the same time, I'm not naive. I know that we can from time to time. We can bump into each other, if you know what I mean. We can step on each other's toes. The Old Testament tells us that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. God uses people to work with people. And, and our interaction with one another, it, it may not always be pleasant because very simply, God sometimes uses other people in our lives to rub off the sharp corners. I mean, iron sharpens iron, but sometimes I think God tries to rub off those, those sharp corners, smooth them out by bringing other people into our paths. And sometimes that can smart. Sometimes that can be a little painful. There are incidents that, that can be hurtful. Jesus referred to it as pruning in the Gospels. And we may be, sometimes be guilty of blaming others when God's really using them in our lives. My point is this, you know, I mean, I've asked this question before in other sermons, but have you ever been hurt by someone? Of course you have. Have you ever been offended by someone? Absolutely. Let me give you a prescription. Let me, get, let me, let me, let me tell you how to handle this, Okay. The next time someone ruffles your feathers, next time someone has offended you, next time some, just please remember this, just three words. Get over it. Get over it. And if you want to, you need a scripture reference for that prescription, Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 9. This then is how you should pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth it is, is, as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Notice verse 12 again. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. How many times are we to forgive a brother's sins against us? What does the word say? And again, Jesus said it. He said, Jesus answered them, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. Now, you know, I never said this would be easy. But I do know it's possible. You know how I know it's possible? Because it's in his word. We've been studying this church. We've been studying the Philippian church. If the Philippian church could put it together, then I believe any church can put it together. But I do want to say this. I thank God for our healthy church. I thank God for our healthy church.